Hello. I welcome you all to the class series. Today we have Gary Schouten. He will present on non-response diets and yeah, that's balancing non-response, uh, reduce non-response diets in this play to work on the RMD data and some stuff. Uh, just a short introduction. Very short is the <laughs> uh, senior methodologist at Statistic Netherlands and associate research professor uh, at the Good Futures University. He graduated in mathematics at the Technical University of Delft in 1995 and finished a PhD in mathematical statistics uh, at the EU University of Amsterdam in 2000. In 2002, he joined uh, the methodology department at Statistics Netherlands. Uh, where he was involved in research on non-response reduction, adjustment, mixed mode survey design, mode effects, and adaptive survey design. He's now the, he was the coordinator for the uh, risk project on RMT. Okay. Ja, ich äh, ich möchte Sie danken, dass Sie es mir eingeladen haben, hier zu kommen und etwas zu erzählen. Ich, äh, Es wird eine komische Präsentation sein, wenn ich hier an Deutsch hier das weitergehe. So, also ich möchte es ja, ja, am Englisch tun. <lacht> <lacht> Aber ich kann es ein bisschen verstehen. So, wenn Sie wollen, können Sie auch fragen in Deutsch. Ja. Ich sehe, also Sie hat einen guten Spaß. Ja, ich bin Senior Methodologist at Statistics Netherlands for a little over 10 years now. And, um, Working a lot on non-response, non-response bias, ways to reduce it, uh, mostly in data collection, not so much in the estimation, but more in the, in the sort of avoiding it rather than uh, uh, afterwards in the estimation. So that's what I will present today. Uh, I will give you some background. So why are we? Why am I doing this? Um, of course, then there is a lot of stuff that we've done on indicators. So we'll briefly talk about them with this again. Um, but the main question is, uh, if we would focus on, say, proxy measures for non-response bias, which we usually do based on auxiliary information, does that do any good? I mean, we can detect uh, bias, and then we can try to avoid it in a way, but uh, of course, the, very legitimate question would be, why bother and just let it go after the collection? You have still have that same auxiliary information, and we can fix it on the, uh, in the estimation procedures. So in between, I will have a very short semester for uh, adaptive designs and multi-mode -mod surveys, because right now that is really driving the, the research that we are doing. Okay. So this is basically a timeline, so there's a lot of information there. I'm not, going to, I'm not going through all of this. Um, why did we start looking at these kind of indicators uh, some years ago? Well, at roughly 2005, statistics science became a sort of more or less autonomous institute. And at, at the time, that meant that we had to find our own performance indicators. We had to judge about ourselves and what we were doing. And then management was um, saying, okay, we want the indicator should be the response rate. That's our one of the key uh, performance indicators. And in the coming years, we should uh, increase that response rate by 1% every year. <laughs> very strange uh, decision. Mm -hmm. we? So we said, well, that sounds like a, that's not very hard to do. You just uh, go you throw away these hard cases, and you go for after the easier ones right away. And uh, so we, we wanted to find something that sort of counteracted that kind of tendency to go for the higher response rate. Uh, of course, high response rates by themselves are a good uh, objective. I mean, but you will reduce eventually the risk of bias if you do so. So then we started, uh, later on, we started a, a European framework program project working on these kind of indicators for some years with various countries. So if you know about these indicators, much of the work came from that uh, project. There's also a website. So the, riskproject.eu still exists. Still everything that we produce is 
uploaded to this website, although it's the project has already stopped for some years. So. Um, and at the, at the time, then we also had a, a big change in modes. So when I started doing research, most of our surveys were face to face or telephone. That was sort of the traditional way of doing it. And then, in a very, very gradual way, all surveys got transformed to mobile money surveys, including online data collection, making paper, also. And this, this um, transition started to dominate everything we do because we found out that a mode is not just about selection, it's also about measurement. Well, it's, of course, you know that, but we found a lot of uh, um, breaks in our time series that we would attribute to measurement differences, not to selection differences. So from there on, uh, gradually we started to look more into designs that also account for measurement error rather than just non-response error. Uh, which is, of course, very complicated. So more recently, we are last year we established a uh, network with uh, a few universities and institutions in the, in the U.S. where we think about adaptive design uh, in a Bayesian way. So we try to incorporate historic knowledge or um, historic estimates for particular parameters uh, into the, the design itself. So we start to Optimize based on what we think will happen rather than what we see right away. Okay, there's also a website for this if you're interested. So, what, what, are, what are these uh, proxy indicators? Uh, basically, we had a, a few very simple definitions, very intuitive, I guess. This, um, response is okay as long as it looks like it's a subsample, sort of a random process. Making your sample smaller than it usually than it was, but at random. So then it's still a nuisance because it reduces our uh, the size of our response. But we can account for it. It's essentially not a problem. Of course, this is more like a conceptual uh, idea. It's never testable, and it's, it's probably not true too. So, so we started to think about it more in terms of observer information. So when something's a response is representative to relative to something, and that auxiliary information then becomes actually very important because from one X to the other X, the conclusion might be very different. So I could say that's representative for gender, but it's not age. So it's really dependent on age. We also had a more sort of elaborate definition that if you would have some information, let's say um, Z, uh, then the, re the response is not dependent on X, condition on that. So that's more like, what are the variables that we should focus on? Are there variables that are not so important once we know other ones? It's a conditional sense. So then we have these um, indicators or R indicators, nothing more than like a transformation of the propensity of variation. A very simple. Idea, so this should be somewhere between zero and one. Usually, it's relatively close to one, but it depends, of course, on the variables x that go into these models or non-response. So, if you, the more x, the more the variation you will naturally find. So, if you if you do compute it, you should keep the x fixed from one uh, situation to the other. Otherwise, you're comparing our apples and oranges. Then there's another uh, measure which is very similar. Instead of coefficient of variation, which is basically the very well, the standard deviation over the uh, response rate. So the, the bar here means the average response propensity, which is always roughly the response rate. Now, there are a lot of other indicators around, and um, I don't have time to go into that in too, too much detail. And, um, ourselves, we sort of develop sort of subclasses of indicators based on our indicators. Which decompose variances in, in sort of like an ANOVA kind of way. We call them partial indicators, so I will not talk about them today. There's also a lot of other indicators in the literature, and what I try to do here is try to connect them to, um, to each other. And uh, there, uh, I guess we need a bit more time to, to go, go over all these uh, formulas. That would be so interesting. But, Indicators developed by uh, in Sweden have a very strong similarity to R indicators. So 
basically you can always write them into each other. And they are usually proportional to each other. So if you, if you compute one, the other gives you the same kind of signal. Then there's also the fraction of missing information, which is a bit of a complicated expression here. So this is the response rate. This is what we call efficiency determination, which is basically the amount of variation that you can understand. So the y of x is the prediction for y given that I know x. It's my prediction of what the person will, want, will say. Whereas the y is the true variation. So if this is if this tends to one, which means that my model is perfect. I can completely understand what the y variable will do. And then this term, this will turn to one, and in fact f my will turn to zero. So f my is measuring and to some extent my ability to, to understand the y variable. Well, anyway. And there's another indicator that's not used so often, but it's the estimated bias based on response. So these calligraphic R's over here mean that they are based on response. It's the only way one thing you can do. If you like, we can return to the sheet later on. So what we uh, what we do in daily monitoring right now is we follow the response rate, and on the y-axis we have this R indicator. And we sort of follow it in time. So this is actually the pattern that we observed last month for the household. So in various uh, various time points. So um, the the variables that go into these R indicators are fixed. Fixed set of variables that we use all the time. And then um, these diagonal lines over here, they come from what we call sort of equal bias lines. It's, of course, it is not really equal bias. We don't really know the bias. But it comes down to, uh, let me see, they have, would have an equal coefficient of variation over here. And uh, why that is interesting, I will come back to that question later. For, for the moment, um, if you haven't seen this before, these are sort of equal coefficient variations for response capacities. And we like uh, the response to be here somewhere at this point. Now, we never achieved that in reality. Okay, so if I want to talk about does, is it effective to balance response during data collection, there is no other way than to start thinking about how should we adjust because. I'm claiming that if I have the opportunity to balance, uh, to estimate differently afterwards, I should use my auxiliary information afterwards to uh, correct. And of course, I need to come up with estimators. And then I have to show that these estimators uh, themselves still have more bias. And I do not balance. That's sort of the, the approach. So the, the obvious, of course, very naive estimator <coughs> is the mean. So if you would, if you would account for the sampling design, so the, the inclusion probabilities get in there, then it's the whole assumption estimator or expansion estimator. Uh, then there are three basically sort of uh, strategies to adjust. So the, the response mean does is not is nothing. It's just there's some y variable. There's non-responsive response, but it doesn't use any of information. Just that's what we have. The response, we take the mean, that's all. Now the next step would be um, the inverse propensity weighting. Inverse propensity weighting essentially tries to understand why people respond. So you, you, you try to model uh, the, the, the non-response mechanism, maybe through logistic or other kinds of regressions. And what come, comes out are Estimated response propensities, and they, they go into the denominator. So you, you sort of weight inversely proportional to, to what you think is the response probability. Well, the, the alternative option is, of course, to start modeling the y. Which this is the traditional way. So generalized regression is actually based on the idea that I try to model my y variable through auxiliary information. And this kind of approach existed way before non-response was accounted for in sampling period. Sampling period was originally just about full response, 100% response. And then we would try to use this kind of expressions to, if the, the residual terms are very small, I have a very low prediction. So this is, um, 
regression estimation. And of course, um, what you could do is you could do both at the same time. That's what this doing, uh, in, what is done in double robust estimation. So you, you have a regression model for your y, but you account for the propensity weights. And uh, the variables that go into uh, these propensity weights can be different than the ones that go into your y model. That's, that's why it looks different. But I, I can uh, tell you that as, when you have a very big sample size, or you don't have a lot of x variables, and, it's, and these three basically always use give you the same results. It's, it's very close. Only if you if you have very uh, small sample sizes, or you really have to figure out what uh, have a lot of observed variables, what should I use? Then these these start to become different because you have more informed kind of model. So, yeah. If, by the way, if there are, are there questions along the way, don't hesitate to, to ask them. So here again, there are these four estimators. And now what you can, what you can do is you can approximate the bias of these indicators. Uh, sorry, these estimators. So this is maybe uh, you have seen this before. It's, uh, it's an expression that turns out that comes up in literature every now and then. So the bias of the mean is the covariance between what you're trying to observe, the y, and the propensity divided over the mean with propensity. So that's where the CV comes from, because essentially the CV is trying to model this, so it's trying to sort of find the, of course we don't know the Y variable, but you could say any covariance is always smaller than the, the, the standard deviation of the row itself, by definition, because its uh, correlations are smaller than one and bigger than minus one, this covariance must be, is bounded by the standard deviation of the rows on both sides. So that, that's the reason why we look at it. But the other, um, <clears throat> the other estimators, they can also be approximated. And yeah, again, maybe it's too much to go into in detail, but if, if effectively what you see is there's residuals. So there's covariance between residuals in the model and what you're interested in. So here, there's a residual covariance between the error terms and rho. So if you manage to completely understand uh, y, the y variable given the x, and these are practically zero. There is no residual. You just understand exactly what's going on. And this, this covariance tends to zero too. On the other hand, if this is also like a residual, if, the, if you understand rho very well, then this starts to become almost like one. It's, it's uh, sort of going around one, and this covariance goes to zero. Now here you can see why this is called a double robust esti estimator, because there are two terms, there are error terms in there. So if either of the one, either one of the two has become very small or constant, then it's, the covariance vanishes. Anyway, um, you can prove that going from these expressions here, you can always bound these um, uh, biases by these kind of terms. That's, there's a lot of uh, um, mathematics or algebra behind that, but you can prove that there, it should be in an interval that can that cannot be wider than a certain uh, size, and that size is determined by this. Now, if you if you change that expression, you can rewrite it to this, like this. So you can say it's actually a, a difference in squared coefficients of variation between the true row that you're interested in and the one that you have estimated from the auxiliary variables, and then this increases the variation again. So if either you manage to find a perfect model for the y or a perfect model for the x, then this interval shrinks to a point, and you have no bias. But of course, um, usually these are relatively uh, small. This is also. So usually the interval is very wide. That's a normal model. OK, so I'll. So try to keep this in mind for a while. I'll, I'll, I'll make now I'll make a short intermezzo um, to adapt to the survey, uh, survey designs because these designs that's uh, we try to actually uh, get these indicators as small as possible. That's that's the objective in, the, in these designs. So can we allocate our resources in such a way that uh, these kind of indicators get as well, as balanced as possible? So they get very, very small. 
And um, but there's of course a bit more behind it than just um, indicators. Uh, you need also need to have uh, let's say uh, 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 levers, tools, things to do. You need we have a range of strategies that you can employ to to actually change something. So if you um, if you do a survey, you, you could do a follow-up, you could use incentives or different interviewers or uh, change of mode and so on. So these are actually your, your tools, the, the, the possibilities. And um, the measures are just summarizing what's going on. It's nothing more than that. So the, the other important aspect is that it's not just about responses, it's about, about costs, of course, because I, I think that I could just allocate an arbitrary amount of resources and maybe I get a balance, but I don't have a budget. So if I, I need to stay within budget in some way. That's, the, the, that's actually the, um, the element that makes adaptive certain designs uh, require uh, optimization. So it's like, uh, what's the best way to do it given uh, the, uh, the budget? So what you would you can see in the literature about adaptive designs is right now there are basically four kinds of approaches. One would be just uh, as usual, you just try. So you do a pilot or some experiment, and you have a good sense of what groups would react, react positively to certain um, change of strategies, like um, I don't know, you give incentives to the lower income quantiles or. Uh, you change your strategy in big cities. Uh, it could be a lot of different things. So it is not really a very structured modeling behind that, but it's good sense, common sense sort of uh, thinking, and it could be successful too. So uh, these three are a bit more structured. So case prior prioritization means that you model non-response and you start to rank cases. And you start with the, the ones that have the lowest propensity. And then you work your way up. So the, the case that have very high propensity, you you, well, you put them on uh, at last in your uh, last position. Uh, you could also try to use uh, uh, quota or stopping rules. This is, of course, uh, there's mixed feelings about this. You must, you must of course remember that you still start from a probability sample, but still working with quota sounds a bit like uh, fishing. But uh, you could do it. You could say, I set very high uh, thresholds to my response rates in all strata, and I stop collecting data once I meet that threshold. So if, if that is a very high threshold, then it starts to make sense. Maybe. And then the last option would be to have to re really explicitly write all this in terms of a mathematical optimization problem. And that's the, you know, this, on this particular option, we spent a lot of time in the last years. So uh, can we? Write all these cost functions and uh, quality indicators in terms of um, probability, allocation probabilities, as we call it. And then these will become the decision variables that you need to solve and eventually get the sort of best solution. Well, while doing this, uh, we, um, I think our own management said, well, it's, it's all very nice that you. We're thinking about response rates and so on. But our budgets are going down. Uh, we see measurement effects. Don't uh, think of these very detailed designs, uh, whether I should do an additional call or an additional uh, visit in the evening or something. You should be looking at the more big, bigger picture. So, um, so we also started to think about uh, measurement errors. And then the problem becomes a lot more complicated. Uh, one strategy could be have a positive effect on response, but a negative effect on measurement. Anyway, so we, we, we very well know that between online and, and interviewer surveys are sometimes very big gaps in the answers that we get. So then we see, okay, you do a face-to-face -face follow up, response rate go up uh, very strong, but we see the differences in the statistics. So what's better? Is the, should we have the more more people, or should we have? Uh, so there's a, a lot of discussion about that. Um, well, in, in that we distinguish two kinds of settings. Which uh, one is the first one is the most common one. So we have a survey with a few key statistics. 
we would focus directly on those. But if you're in a panel setting where you have a survey with a lot of different uh, modules, of course you have to think a bit uh, more general. So how can we uh, account for measurement error in a setting where the survey has a lot of different issues or questions or topics? So from there we started to think about uh, um, what we call data quality propensities. It's a meaningless term if you don't think you can find it in the literature. We st sort of start to think about what's the propensity that a person with certain characteristics so so some kind of answering behavior, like he's a speeding through the questionnaire, or he's um, um, providing a lot of don't knows, or providing a lot of item numbers. So this is, uh, I think this is the answer, right? Yeah. So now, now I'll go back to this um, original question. But I, I have this to match to, to show that actually what, what we are doing here, um, it's, I think it's already a, a bit too naive a way that it way. Well, I, I will look at, um, I'll, I'll approach that this general question from two angles. One would be, um, can I sort of come up with some theory or at least a, a framework that makes sense that explains why going for more balanced response is profitable? Or can I find conditions under, what, under which that is true? The other option would, of course, be uh, can I just find any proof? Can I just look at a lot of data and surveys? Do I find that more balanced surveys do it satisfy? If that's the case, then I have another uh, answer to the question. Um, now these questions are easily asked. They're very hard to solve or answer because, if we, of course, if we would know anything about bias, then usually uh, we would be in a very, very particular situation. We rarely know bias on Santa Fairs in certain. But let's start from that second point of view. So, how am I doing with the time? Three minutes. Three minutes. Oh. <laughs> 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 it's always like that. <laughs> um, okay. Let's say you have two options to, 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 to look at this question. I, I think. The easiest one is, and that's only if you're in a luxury position. So you do data collection and your budget is ext extremely high, and the only thing you're going to do is to do less. So, of course, if you do less, you could, you could say, what I'm doing. The high budget, that's my benchmark, and everything less is, is worse. So then I can start looking at adaptive designs that do less and see what is the impact. That's very, not, I don't find it a very interesting solution. The other option would be to split auxiliary variables in, into uh, in sort of training and validation variables. One set is actually used to improve, the other ones are used to evaluate. And this is more interesting. and. Um, our statistical statistics analysis, we haven't had a lot of administrative data. So we, we could actually do this. We could separate uh, variables into uh, different sets. Okay. Well, basically, what we've done is um, we collected a lot of data, uh, data. This, again, would be maybe a paper by itself, but um, uh, we selected variables. We, uh, we linked auxiliary variables, and we, and we, and we Sort them at, at, at random, in a random order. We started to, uh, to add auxiliary variables one by one. And then we rank different designs based on variable one, variable one plus two, variable one plus two plus three. And so we followed uh, the preferences that the indicators give when we started to add variables one at a time. And uh, we did account for uh, collinearity in that. So if there is any uh, signal in there, if there's any Consistency in the preferences that these ranks are showing, then, it, then there must be evidence. That was our idea behind this. So I have to go a bit faster. So um, this is actually what came out. So we did. It was a joint effort with Statistics Suite and, and Michigan University, and uh, so we did a lot of. We had a lot of data sets, and when we pulled them, so we pulled them over institutions. We actually found that the, the, the ranked versions were not at all random, so we, they stick. So you'll find some evidence on one variable that, is, that design is better, 
seems to be the case for other reptile variants as well. So here it looks very strong, even. I mean, Peter is very small. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this one. Well, the other option was, um, can, I, can, I, can you come up with some theory, some ideas, what are the conditions under which uh, uh, balancing or being response to be more representative will be effective? Um, that's not so, such an easy uh, exercise because essentially what you're saying is, what does this uh, non missing random universe look like? Because that's that's where the problems come in. The non-response non not missing at random, then my adjustment doesn't work fully. There's still a bias left. So. And uh, how should I model this? So well, my, my idea was, this is still relatively recent work, well, what if I just have a pool of variables? If I have a universe of variables, and I select variables at random. So it might sound a bit strange. So say I, I give you 100 variables on a population, and you're allowed to pick only uh, five. If you would do that, and you would find, let's say, uh, that this uh, coefficient of variation is smaller than it's also be expected to be smaller for the other variables that you did not select, because it's random, randomized. Right? So you, you select the random variables, so this feature of this coefficient is smaller, translates to uh, the general uh, variation for instance. This is maybe a complicated story. Of course, we are, we are never in that situation. We don't, uh, that would be something if we could just pick at random uh, five variables from the universe of possible variables. But what it does say is that uh, although it might be very small, which you would detect, it's a very small signal of uh, more problems on a larger scale. That's, that's the whole rationality behind the adaptive design. But the other theorem would be, which is more natural, to say I select variables from a subset, whatever that means. It could be register variables, or it could be uh, variables on a specific topic or something. Then still that still same theory still is true, but it only applies to a um, uh, coefficient of variation within a certain family of variables, namely exactly the ones where you Exactly that subset. And uh, what, what makes this interesting, these two theorems, if you would look at these expressions, so I had this expression on, well, I don't know, 10 sheets ago. Yeah, the expected uh, fact, uh, this expected uh, remaining bias is, um, will also become smaller. So I would be able to, to draw variables. I find more bias uh, on these variables based on indicators than also the remaining bias in expectation. It doesn't really have to be true for every variable, but in expectation should also be small, even after adjustment, by using any of those uh, estimates. Okay, well, I think I've basically said this, but the interesting, the interesting part is that. Um, these theorems keep on, they still hold if I start to minimize or balance my uh, my design based on these randomly drawn variables. So it's, it's still true. Um, okay. I, I have still, I have two more sheets and then I have discussion. What shall I do? Shall I? Yeah. I think actually, personally, I think this is the most interesting sheet. So, <laughs> so I, uh, what I did is I took from the list panel, which is, uh, uh, well, many of you probably know in Tilburg University. They have core studies, a bit like the Gaze's panel, and they have 10 core studies. And from the core studies, I took all variables, roughly 2,500 that are, are measured. And from the 2,500, I took 1,300 that were directly above the persons themselves, or um, that were not open, that did not have a high refusal rate, not a high don't know rate, and so I, so I, I removed fairs of a lot of problems in a way. So there were 1,300 left, 
and they included standard demographic socioeconomic variables like uh, gender or age or income or so on. Then I looked at the panel, uh, from I looked at the attrition in the panel. So the panel started in 2008, roughly in the beginning of 2008, and I followed attrition uh, up to 2014, roughly six years. And so here you see the attrition rate. Um, what's computed here is if I over all these 1,300 var variables, which I sort of can view with my universe of variables, um, I started to follow the average coefficient variation. So it goes up slightly, small, but it goes up. And you could also predict, based on these uh, theory, what should be the maximum CV. If, the, if really, uh, um, if all these propensities are either 0 or 1, that's maximum damage. <coughs> so the, if what we found with these 1,300 variables is much smaller than what it could be, could be uh, the damage. So it is only like these kind of percentages. So um, sort of these results, but it's probably going to be too fast, sort of suggest that given all these 1,300 variables, and most of the variation we find in the is not accounted for by these variables. So it's all, it seems either it's, it's noise or it's characteristics of persons that we are not interested in, in our sense, poor studies. We don't see anything. Now here we have the standard X variables, so the register variables, let's say. And they, uh, they, they show the same kind of pattern, but they, they're stronger. They have more uh, explanatory power. They just, I guess, um, history has told us that they are not so bad. They're relatively uh, influential variables in many ways. So they, they would pick up a little, bit, a little over a half to one two thirds of the variation. If we believe it's true, of course, debate that. So um, then we went on, but here I think I have to skip, otherwise it takes too long. I also start looking at some of the core variables, like what happened to those, and uh, I would select um, from the 1300 variables based on their association. So then the discussion. So um, I, I personally believe that that's debatable, that there is actually empirical and theoretical, both empirical and theoretical evidence that it helps. Maybe it's not overwhelming, but it's a, I think there is some evidence. But uh, there is a, a side remark to that. Only if you have a lot of variables and a lot of data sets, you will actually be able to see it, because it's very subtle. And um, most data lab studies, we don't have that many variables or that many data sets, you will probably not see it. So it's, it's, it, it's there, but not, it's not very strong. And then there is some discussion about these, uh, yeah. I mean, measurement error is not accounted for in this framework. People just have nonsense all the time. We think it's, um, we have very bad models, but it's just because the covariates are very, very bad. So. Yeah, and I did not say much about uh, estimation of indicators. There's a whole uh, story about these indicators need to be estimated from sample data, which by itself uh, is not so easy because there's a lot of standard uh, sampling variation around it. In fact, they also pick up bias. The sampling variation gets translated to, to artificial uh, variation. And so I think I'll, I'll stop here. Sorry for being here too long. The first, uh, yeah, yeah, basically one, but the other part is that these, these data sets we have over the various. Uh, and, and balancing response, you mean the kind of um, response design? So what the balancing response would be that I actively try to make my indicators look bad. Yeah. Right, yeah. But 
So, so have you compared this to not doing it? So, so um, whether the results of the time don't show a um, selective attrition uh, if yeah. you don't try to balance it? Go back to this one. Um, there's there's really a lot of data behind this. Um, some of them. in fact, there's each data set by itself contains multiple designs of the same survey, or it has um, different surveys in it. So, for instance, one, one of the data sets in these 14 are actually those found. There is also in the 14 data sets, there is a uh, labor force survey with different mode designs. And so in some of those, actually, we actively tried to balance. And the, the, the control group was not, we don't do that, just as usual. So the, in these uh, data sets here, we have some of them are actively trying to balance and some are not. So, but if you would, if you would look at it on an individual data set basis, just one survey, one experiment, the uh, picture is much more mixed. So some surveys, it was very clear. The balancing uh, seemed to work. Um, and in other surveys, it doesn't seem to be much. It, I also have a table like this for each in, uh, individual uh, data. And then the, the, the p values are sometimes, uh, well, uh, doesn't say much, could be. Could be just coincidence or something else. But basically, what we try to do here is say, okay, a more balanced response is that any good? Such variables, and you would actually try to improve response based on that. And here, it would very different. But the question is, how do you get this kind of information? And there, there is, if you don't, if you can't link it, there are only a few options. Uh, one is um, you, you, you look directly to, to the population. You get a, a more like a benchmark or population kind of information. From that, you can still you can still compute these indicators. But since you don't know the values of the non respondents, you cannot do anything. You can just say, okay, I, I should do more about uh, these income groups. Unfortunately, I don't know who they are in the non response. So the only thing you could do in that setting is actually try to change your uh, strategy so that they probably be more effective for the low income groups. Hopefully, that is. But you can't target. The other option, of course, would be to, to use some of these uh, observations. Data kind of information, but they are often uh, subject to measurement error themselves. And so far, literature hasn't shown very great evidence that they are strong. But that, I think that's the options that you have. But if you if you are able to, um, uh, I guess you should you should have a bit more opportunities to link your data. I mean, if you don't have information, then there's no way you can solve it. Yeah, I have a question from maybe a more practical point of view. I probably was not able to follow your, all your statistical considerations. If we have a situation, for instance, that we have some kind of uh, model which estimates the response probabilities of a sample before people start to have data mm -hmm. from a first, 
And we had some models for the response propensities. The question for me is, how do we decide which type of effort, which measure best should be used in order to increase or to come up with a more balanced uh, response propensity mm -hmm. in CN, for instance. I usually would expect that we have a lot of heterogeneity. If people having the same response propensity, there might be people with a low propensity because they are difficult to be contacted. There are others which are quite reluctant and so on. And uh, yeah, and very simple, but you would say, OK, for the first uh, group, you would need uh, more contact attempts for the other, take an incentive or whatever. So if we have the situation that we have such a model, how do we decide which are the best measures mm -hmm. in order yeah, to really come up with a better result? Yeah, and this, this is actually about the interaction between so what you can do and how people respond to that, or whatever your population is. So, yeah, that could, that could, could either just be based on speculation. If you think if I do this, then that particular group will do better. But ideally, you have data that can support, support certain decisions. And, and I mean, this I, I present it very clinically like I have X and I do this, this is a strategy, so, and then it's better. But of course, if the, the, the actions that you take to improve are not. Say directly is linked to the people you're looking at, then it's sort of arbitrary. So what I could easily do is I have a response and I, uh, I just throw the cases. Very easy. I, uh, I, uh, and I do it in such a way that exactly the balance is perfect. There's no, no problem. Like it's, it could be a data set I can make the response prevention look like they're completely flat. But this, of course, is very artificial because I've done it myself. I just throw away cases. So I, yeah, I, I think to really become effective, you need to these observe information only give you clues. Okay, the low income groups don't do so well. Why would that be? What can I do to get them into my in my survey? But it's, there's a lot of uh, knowledge about data collection strategies and procedures behind that to make such a decision. But. but but I do believe if you are able to come up with strategies that sort of bat uh, battle these non response groups <clears throat> and you might measure it to increase the response rate, that other variables are going with it that you might be interested in. <laughs> Any more questions? I have somewhat of a follow up to that. Um, maybe I didn't understand it completely or so. Uh, your strategy, in a way, just to contact or not to contact here? Or did you have more, or did, did you incorporate incentive? Yeah, and in these data sets, uh, the, what we did vary was, are we going to do a follow-up in case of this, yes or no? So we just stick to online, or are we going to send it in? That was one option. One is, are we going to uh, increase the number of calls or visits? So have we extended the data collection period, yes or no? Some of these data sets, there is also a change interview. So, Statistics Sweden data sets, for instance, there is a follow up with a change interview. Should I do that, yes or no? So, and for what group should I do that? So, these, there are different, um, there are also uh, business surveys in there, it's a very really mixed data sets. And for business surveys, it's more about uh, uh, the number of reminders that we sent. Um, so, it's, uh, it's, we try to get a really diverse set of data. Uh, see what is the general picture. And the second was uh, your comment on, on dropping cases to better uh, to, to but would that be equivalent to, to, to waiting for everything you can do with uh, by taking out cases you can reach out by waiting by by yeah if I if I, uh, if I throw out cases myself I, at random I should not be able to affect the regression coefficients I think they are still the same so uh, if I would adjust that rating, it should come out. It should still give you the same statistic as long as I use the same variables. If I stay within the same set of axes, that's okay. but your variance will go up. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's still profitable to, to keep the number five. I had 
one general question. Um, in your whole approach, you always model the predicted probability to uh, uh, Isn't that a general problem that this, this predicted probability is bounded between one and zero? I mean, very often, what the photographers do is that they model the logistic regression. Um, and why don't you stay at the, at the logic, logic uh, log odds level, which is normally distributed because of the variance and all that stuff of, of the underlying index function. I, I would, I was the yeah, impression mm -hmm. that, that it has better statistic properties than the predicted probability. And I think the reason uh, my uh, results on bias should, should, uh, should stay. I, I, don't, I find it harder to directly link these, these kind of statistics to be biased on actual statistics. Okay. Whereas for probabilities, I can understand how that affects uh, the eventual bias. Also, I, I don't really want to be, uh, I don't really care about so much about the link function. In fact, that should be, if that creates a big, Impact, it has a big impact on whether you yeah. or program, whatever. And then I start to distrust my own uh, because I don't want to have this sort of technical element. But it, it, it's, uh, I guess, as soon as your propensity starts to get very close to zero one, then you get all these kind of issues with uh, link functions that maybe you should be very careful anyway. So I'm not sure whether that answers your question. In a way. <laughs> I mean, I guess in your application, you will have very often things where you have very low response rate, and then it depends very much on your statistical model, yeah. which has some link functions into it. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest uh, differences in response rate that I would see is going up from 20 to 60 or so in one circle. That's a range you would see normally. Thank you again for the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I guess, and you stay here just today. No, tomorrow's for tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, if you have any questions about this, and, uh, I went very fast through a lot of different topics, and I realized that. So um, you can always send a, an email or